the four minute warning if the, the sirens would go and uh, our actions when that went off we had four minutes to scramble every aircraft that could fly off the base welcome to cold war conversations <laughs> This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Fünf, zwei, sieben, eins, sechs, sechs, neun, acht, acht, drei. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 43 of Cold War Conversations. Today we're speaking with Nick Anderson, who was a RAF Phantom a Jet fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force. We discuss flying in the Cold War and in detail how the RAF would have responded to a nuclear attack. We also talk about his time with the Quick Reaction Alert Units and how they worked. And we also hear details of a number of missions Nick flew intercepting the Soviet Tupolev Tu-95, codenamed the Bear by NATO. Before we start the episode, I wanted to thank everyone who's supporting the podcast financially via Patreon and one-off donations. Uh, now, some of you may not realise that this podcast is a one-man band and the podcast is financed out of my own pocket. Now, when I started this in March 2018, I had no idea how popular this was going to be and have been astonished by the interest, your feedback and the generosity of my guests in allowing me to share their stories. However, this popularity does increase the costs of putting the podcast out. And if all our listeners just paid a dollar, a pound or a euro a month, I'd be able to do far more. Now, you might wonder what this Patreon is that I keep banging on about with every episode. Well, simply, it makes it dead easy to support the podcast. Just visit patreon.com slash cold war pod that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cold war pod choose your level of support there's varying levels there from a uh, dollar a pound or a euro up to higher levels where you receive additional benefits i then receive that amount monthly and in addition you get access to previews and other exclusive extras that don't make it into the free version of the show so just go to patreon.com slash Cold War pod or go to our website, coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option. Don't miss details of the show notes at the end of this episode where Nick has very generously shared some great photos of his intercepts with those Soviet aircraft. And there's some really interesting video there as well. Now, back to today's episode, we start out by describing the Phantom itself and its difference from the US version. We welcome Nick Anderson. Tell me about the Phantom. What, 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 if you can just describe the plane itself, because I think you, you mentioned it's, it's a two-seater. The Phantom, uh, well, we got the aircraft from the Americans uh, because uh, we had scrapped TSR-2 and gone as far as breaking all the uh, the rigs so that they could never ever resurrect the project the labor government played with the idea of getting f-111s but then been that uh losing their deposit as it were um and the the one thing they had decided that we were going to do were uh eventually was to f uh, buy some f-4 phantoms um now the version that they built for the royal air force was different to all the other phantoms that had been built uh the the uh, government decided that they wanted a large British component uh, built into this aircraft. And they, I mean, what they decided to do was to put Rolls-Royce engines in. So the Rolls-Royce Spey was the chosen engine. It had really only operated, uh, you know, basically as an airliner, airliner engine. Uh, and when they tried to squeeze it to shoehorn it into the fuselage of a, 
Phantom, they found it wouldn't fit. It was it was fatter, and it was a high bypass engine, so it needed a lot of airflow. So they needed bigger intakes, um, and uh, they basically changed the shape of the fuselage. Now, when you're at high supersonic speed. Uh, the shape of the fuselage is actually quite important. In fact, the overall um, drag index of the aircraft uh, needs to resemble something uh, like uh, an ogival body, uh, a body that is starts at a point, expands to a fat bit, and then retracts back to a point again. Um, and uh, they call that area rule, and it uh, reduced the amount of supersonic drag that aircraft experiences. So... Um, the initial uh, Phantoms had been built with what they called a Coke bottle-shaped fuselage, so that where the wings were, uh, the fuselage was slim, and uh, where the wings weren't, it was slightly fatter, and this gave it that lovely overall cross-section of um, size. And um, with our Phantom, we're squeezing that fat old uh, um, spay in, they had to make the fuselage fatter. Uh, so it was quite an expensive airplane to build because it was uh, a different model completely to the ones that the uh, Americans were building for themselves. Uh, it uh, had a lot of problems with the engine, marrying this engine in and getting a reheat onto it that would work tr proved to be a big problem. Um, the reheat uh, on uh, the uh, J79 powered Phantoms lights almost instantaneously. On, on ours, it took about five seconds and it had to light in stages because they discovered when they tried to re light the reheat fast, it used to blow the engine out and you'd often get flames leaping out of the front. Um, and uh, they had a lot of engine destruction, a lot of engine failures uh, because of the reheat. Um, so the reheat lit slowly and in stages. The Navy used to have a, have a special modification so that they could get it to light fast when they were landing it on a carrier in case they missed the wire uh, and had to bolt. Um, but we weren't allowed to use that mod, so uh, we were stuck with, uh, with that. Uh, the aircraft was a little slower, a little heavier than the uh, American ones, uh, and, uh, of course, it was about the most expensive fandom that uh, anyone had built. But from our point of view, it was uh, it was brilliant from an air defense point of view, that mainly because of its fantastic radar. It had the uh, Westinghouse Org 11 uh, stroke 12, depending on which version you flew, um, and it was a pulse Doppler radar. And that technology was still relatively new and uh um, you know, the Lightning didn't have it. Uh, in fact, Phantom was the only aircraft in the Air Force that had a pulse Doppler radar. And the wonderful advantage about that radar was that you could point it at the ground, and instead of uh, receiving a huge, great big green return from the massive uh, Earth that's underneath you, um, the radar completely ignored that. It didn't look for a, a return that was based on a time base like a normal pulse radar does, like the radar you get around an airfield, for example. It sends out a pulse, it hits an aircraft, you get the return, you measure the time that's taken, and you get a, a range. You know the mm. azimuth because you know where the antenna was pointing when it picked it up. On the pulse Doppler radar, it measures the change in frequency that you get from your return. So if the aircraft's flying towards you, the frequency will be higher, and if it's flying away, the frequency would be lower. But whatever happens, the Earth is always the same return. It's always the same as your ground speed. And once you know that speed, which you can measure, then you can notch it out. You can remove that huge return that is the Earth's surface, which means the only things you'll see are things that are moving over it. And if you uh, ignore low-speed things like cars and uh, other you know, slow-speed uh, returns, then you will instantly pluck out aircraft that are flying. Um, the great advantage of that was seeing things at level. The great disadvantage was you didn't know how far away it was because not being able to use that time base, you couldn't calculate a distance. You could triangulate a distance using the antenna angle, uh, and the, assuming the aircraft you're looking at was at low level, you'd look at your height, the antenna angle, and 
gauge a distance, but it wasn't until you locked the radar up did you get a an accurate distance. And once you locked the radar up, they knew you were coming. So they'd yeah. often disappear. And of course, the one easy way for them to disappear was for them to turn at 90 degrees to us so that they effectively were doing the same speed as the ground and they'd disappear into that very notch that we used to take out so we couldn't see them anymore. Right, right. And that was a a tactic they were, tra the opposition were trained in to do um, that? Certainly are. All, our, all the Air Force guys knew how to do it. All the bomber pukes knew how to do it. Um, um, if the Soviets were trained in that, I'm not sure. But let's remember that uh, um, most of the uh, most of the threat that we were expecting were going to be large scale raids, not flown necessarily low level, but yeah. uh, uh, on medium level. So uh, you know, we we wouldn't uh, just need to rely on pulse Doppler. We could uh, switch on the pulse mode and use that to find guys, just as you would have done in a lightning, for example. Right. Except because our radar was if the scanner was so big and it was so capable. We used to have a great range on that radar. We could pluck people out, uh, you know, a hundred miles or more away from us. And and what what were you told about the the, the Soviets and you know about what what their probable tactics were going to be in the event of a Warsaw Pact invasion? Well, uh, when I finished the OCU and got posted, I got sent up to RAF Lucas, which is in Scotland. So what we we up there were expecting to do was, one, we had a big task to defend the Navy. The Navy no longer had any aircraft carriers, and we'd acquired all their Phantoms. And in return, we were supposed to uh, be Santa signed and defend the Navy. So often we'd be way out over the ocean uh, looking to provide air cover for the fleet uh, with tankers there um, uh, to give us fuel if we needed. Um, and the rest of the time we were defending our little part of uh, the coastline. Uh, so, you know, eastern uh, uh, UK, uh, both right up northern Scotland and down, uh, you know, halfway down into England. And then, of course, you meet the Leeming squadrons and uh, the rest down there, but so that was our area. Now we'd be stationed, expect to be stationed on patrols, uh, you know, 50, 100 miles out. And what we were uh, expecting were regiment size raids of bombers, uh, often nuclear armed, often with um, air cruise missiles. Although in those days, things like the kangaroo they used to sling under the bear was the size of a Nat trainer. They were vast and pretty inaccurate, but the Soviets made up for that by having enormously powerful nuclear heads on them. So that was um, what we were expecting to attack. And these raids were going to come regiment size 10 or 20 aircraft at a time. Um, so we needed to, uh, to have a number of aircraft up to face them. Each aircraft carried uh, eight missiles. So we could probably take down, uh, hopefully, four or five um, each. Uh, that would probably be a little bit optimistic because, of course, these aircraft would be uh, contain self-defense jamming. They would have jammers uh, in, mixed in amongst them who were more powerful and more dedicated. So we often worked in a strong uh, ECM environment, electronic countermeasure environment, where both our radios were jammed and our radars were being jammed as well. And there was a great deal of training trying to deal with that kind of a threat. But that's that's what we were facing. And when we got airborne, uh, in a expected to get airborne if the, the, we ended up in a fighting war, we fully um, considered the possibility that when we turned around to come back to our home base to land, there would be nothing there. Um, you know, we didn't expect to be able to stop every aircraft that was coming over. And if it was a, uh, a nuclear war that we were going to face, then our base was going to be one of the prime targets uh, where our families lived, uh, you know, all our friends lived, and, uh, our, you know, our squadron, our mates, uh, we're all going to be there, and, and that's what we were fighting to defend. And we would regularly practice um, this type of uh, an exercise where we would get uh, squadrons of Balkans would uh, 
steam towards the UK, and we would be tasked to go up and intercept them and uh, try and uh, you know shoot down as many as we could uh, in the time available. So it was um, it was all a very serious job. I mean, you can't get too serious when you're a young man in the Air Force, but the job was certainly very serious. Yeah, no, absolutely. And were you given instructions as to what to do if nuclear war broke out and your base was destroyed? Not really. We we all talked about it. Obviously, you divert to any base that was still available and open. Mm. And uh, most of us had uh, taken a close look at what was uh, around in Scotland. And I, I personally had picked out a stretch of the A9, which was uh, going to be uh, long enough and straight enough for me to park my Phantom. So that was my plan. If, I, if there was no one else to go, I didn't want to eject and dump the aircraft. I thought, well, if I can get it down on a piece of road, then, uh, you know, it might be of some use. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it might be safer than ejecting. But, uh, I mean, we would play these war scenarios uh, very regularly. They were called tachyvals, tactical evaluations. And uh, the, the NATO uh, monitors would come onto the base. Uh, the base would be put on a war footing, all done at no notice. And uh, we would progress through an entire war in about three or four days, uh, up to and including um, the BMU's warning going off, which would indicate that you, you know, the four-minute warning, if you yeah. remember that, uh, the, the sirens would go. And uh, our actions, uh, when that went off, uh, we had four minutes to scramble every aircraft that could fly off the base. And I remember the first time I uh, did it, I was allocated an aircraft, and uh, I wasn't operational. I was just told to go out into this aircraft and check in on the radio when the sirens went off. And when they did, I ran out of this airplane, climbed in, and there wasn't an ejector seat in there. There was just a wooden box. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat on this box and plugged my uh, helmet in and and checked in on the radio and uh, bk hinton i think one of my navs was in the back and, um, and what well, we we couldn't start it up or anything we just sat there and pretended uh that uh, we were going to fly but in theory if you if the airplane could fly regardless of uh what sort of situation you were in the idea was just get it off the ground for the duration of the nuclear attack and then try and put it down somewhere where um, you know it could be used in the future, uh, but uh, in reality, of course, that you know the chances of finding somewhere were pretty remote. Of course, the the rest of the base, all the serviceable aircraft, just went steaming to the end of the runway. It was quite a sight to see because you imagine they've got two full squadrons of Phantoms, and uh, they're all trying to get airborne within four minutes. And uh, the uh, air traffic control didn't give any clearances. All they did was just give a continuous broadcast of the runway and use in the QFE, the pressure setting for your altimeter. And everyone sprinted to their airplane, started them up, and we taxied to the runway just as fast as you could uh, get onto the runway, no takeoff clearance. Uh, if there was another aircraft at the same time, you'd just line up beside them and go off as a pair, and then immediately behind you, aircraft would be pouring onto the runway, and the leak reheats would be going off, and these aircraft would just be pouring into the air. And often at night, the uh, sight if you weren't flying one were quite incredible watching, uh, you know, uh, 15, 20, 25 airplanes going off in such a short time and just disappearing into the black to go off and uh, uh, and face whatever threat they were, uh, you know, yeah. were looking at. Um, and the famous story of when the Navy was still on the base uh, when I first arrived, of uh, it was always a bit of a, a mark of honor if you were the first aircraft to get airborne on a survival scramble. Um, and uh, the Navy tried to go across the grass in this <laughs> fact to get ahead of the queue. And uh, he almost got bogged down, so he lit his reheats. And you could see this aircraft not pointing down a runway, 90 degrees, full burner, trying to get through the mud and grass and get onto the runway ahead of some other airplane. That was wow. Wow. Wow, that that must have been, well, uh, an incredible sight seeing like a, a multi-squadron scramble like that. But, uh, 
Oh, very much so, yeah. Um, I remember doing an exchange with the German Phantom Squadron. Uh, I think it, the base was, it was not far from Munich. I think it was Egebeck, although someone will probably correct me. And uh, the squadron uh, we um, spent some time with, did our little exchange with, were, their nickname were the Zapatas, Viva Zapata. Uh, and they were named after a Mexican a uh, revolutionary hero. And the reason for that was in their early days, they had a squadron at either end of the runway. And uh, when they got airborne on a survival squadron, both squadrons taxied to the closest end of the runway and started getting airborne. Of course, they were pointing at each other. And as they got airborne, wow. they just jinked, both turned right and passed each other. And there was an American uh, um, observer, NATO observer, who looked at them and said, probably not in a very PC manner, oh, my God, it's just like the Mexican Air Force. And um, the, uh, they, they took it to heart. They thought, oh, well, that's quite good. So apparently they uh, wrote to the Mexican government and said, we'd like to name our squadron or give it a nickname that uh, is the same as a Mexican hero. And they were granted permission to use uh, Zapata as their squadron name. What a great squadron they were, and a fine bunch of guys, and they all had these incredibly droopy Mexican moustaches. So uh, that little anecdote on the side. That's a great, sorry. That's a great story, that. I'd, I'd not heard that. I mean, I'm, I'm interested with the, and I've not probably looked into this, but with the, the uh, Bundeswehr uh, Luftwaffe, I, I'm presuming they couldn't name them after... Sort of heroes of previous Luftwaffe or or anything like oh, that. Oh, contraire! Oh, contraire! This was a part of the Richthofen wing. Okay. So yes, they they still did honour their their um, war heroes, and uh, to a certain extent, I think that's that was quite right. I mean, obviously, no one uh, there wasn't going to be a Goebbels wing or a um, uh, you know someone who had committed. Uh, war crimes, but certainly the First World War aces uh, were still, um, you know, honoured and quite quite right in my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So um, you're, you're based up in Scotland. I understood that you were part of this quick reaction alert as well. That's right. It, it was one of the primary duties we had. Um, and at that time, we used to have a, a, a northern and a southern QRA, quick reaction alert. Now, there were quick reaction alerts for the bomber boys, particularly out in Germany, where they would have nuclear armed aircraft. Uh, the Vulcan boys, they uh, in uh, down there at Coningsby, not Coningsby, uh, let me think, uh, near Lincoln, Scampton and Waddington, those places, they would have had nuclear armed Vulcans uh, and they were always on readiness. There was always a number of them on readiness uh, just in case there was a no-notice um, attack. Um, so we had a response uh, and from our point of view, uh, we uh, had the, we were the air defense, the, the sort of fighter response. So we maintained two aircraft fully armed uh, every day of the year at uh, initially 10 minutes readiness. So you can imagine at the end of the runway, there's in those days we didn't have hardened aircraft shelters. We were um, we were still a bit like World War II. We had concrete revetments scattered around, which is basically just concrete mm. walls and no roof. Uh, but the QRA was maintained from a tin shed at the end of the runway, uh, and it was... Uh, no, oh, it's reasonably comfortable. Uh, you had a telly in there and a little room with a couple of bunks. Uh, and four of us sat in there, two aircraft. Uh, they had eight missiles and three tanks on each aircraft. And when you came on duty at sort of uh, eight or nine in the morning, you'd uh, take over the aircraft and you would cock it. So you a bit like cocking a gun. That was the idea. You would do all the checks you could do up to uh, the point at which you really started the engines and you prepare the aircraft with all the switches in the right pl place for a very quick startup. And the ground crew would uh, fire everything up and check everything was serviceable. Uh, we even did engine runs to make sure everything was going to run. And then we'd partially disrobe by leaving our helmets uh, balanced on the, uh, on the front of the cockpit and uh, our harnesses hung on the steps and then uh, we'd strip our uh, immersion suits down to our waist because they're hot and uncomfortable to wear. 
uh, and we'd uh, stroll around, um, you know, just basically sitting to wait and see if anything was going to happen. And, uh, you know, with uh, four of you sitting around, um, you know, often, uh, you know, you just pass your 24-hour duty period and nothing would occur. So you'd get a day off at the end of it and uh, then back to the normal squadron work the next day. But every now and again, uh, some Soviet aircraft would poke its nose into our airspace and we'd be uh, uh, we'd be up there taking a look at them. So our airspace uh, was just a sort of NATO area of interest, and it stretched most of the way to Norway, uh, pardon me, up uh, around Faroes, uh, almost up to Iceland, around the top of Scotland, and then across to the west, uh, you know, quite a way into the Atlantic. Uh, and that was the northern QRA area. And then down to the south for southern QRA, it would go up to the French border uh, uh, in the channel, go up around Ireland, and then off uh, again, off to the uh, east towards, uh, um, you know, northern Germany. And uh, if uh, the Soviets came into that uh, space, or in fact anything that we were interested in, uh, we would be launched to go and intercept them. Now, um, we initially were usually brought to cockpit readiness. So from a 10-minute uh, state of readiness, our controlling authority, which was just up the road at a, a big radar base called Bakken, would uh, come through on a secure telebrief line and uh, give us a sit rep uh, situation report saying perhaps that there were a couple of zombies unidentified uh, coming around. they give us a rough position, uh, height and speed, and say if they, you know, if they continue on that course, we're anticipating a uh, a launch of Q1 at such and such a time. So you'd have a little bit of notice, and you'd nip off to the loo, and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, have a grab a quick bite to eat, so you weren't too hungry. And then they would, uh, if it was premeditated, they'd bring you up to cockpit readiness. So uh, the hooters would go, uh, whoever was closest. When the uh, aircraft was brought to cockpit, there would hit a big red button and the hangar doors would automatically crank back. And the ground crew, you, you often nearly trampled to death by them because they were terribly keen to get out there and they had to get the electrics uh, on the ground power units all fired up and uh, make sure everything was set on the aircraft, uh, pull all the uh, missile pins so the missiles were fully armed and ready to go. And we'd leap up into the cockpit, uh, sit down, strap in, helmets on, plug in. And then the aircraft had a, uh, a telebrief line plugged into the uh, tail end, which gave us instant and uh, direct communications to uh, the uh, sector operations center at Bakken, who were uh, the people who were going to control the intercepts initially, certainly, and scramblers. And we'd check in a cockpit, and then we'd be given more information and often scrambled from that point or if the targets turned around then we'd sit there for a half an hour or so perhaps waiting for them to get out of the airspace and then we'd be stood down but when we were launched uh, it was then five minutes to fire up the engines uh, get all your checks done get to the end of the runway and get airborne right so this is from a cold start it would take five minutes for you to get airborne. yeah from completely if you were sitting having a coffee in the crew room 10 minutes but You've been bought cockpit readiness, and you're already strapped in. You're up five minutes, uh, and uh, uh, we 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 frequently did it in way less than that because our aircraft, uh, the FG1, had no inertial navigation system to wind up. We didn't have much to wait for. Uh, almost as soon as you started the engines, uh, you could start taxing. We always had absolute uh, priority over any traffic that was around, so we basically trundled straight onto the end of the runway and roared off. It took no time at all. And so then you're given a course heading to intercept whoever is in the uh, NATO airspace. That's exactly right. So the scramble instruction would give you uh, angels, which is your height and thousands of feet to climb to, give you a heading, give you uh, a frequency. We didn't actually give the actual frequencies. They were all pre-programmed, and we just selected a uh, stud number. So uh, call back and on, on fighter stud, six three or something and uh, we'd uh, use use that and decode that and get a frequency uh, or pre-select it and um, then we'd, we'd roar off on that heading 
But uh, from Lucas, we, we knew we'd have a few hundred miles to go before we'd get close to an intercept. So the initial part of it was just getting ourselves organized, checking in with Buck and uh, uh, getting the latest information, getting a decent heading. And they would basically control you up towards the target if, if they could still see it. If it had dropped down to low level out of their radar coverage, they'd be predicting where it was going to come. And they put you on a... Uh, a camp, a combat air patrol, uh, which you uh, was basically uh, like a holding pattern. Uh, and every time you pointed uh, in the threat direction, you'd use your radar to scan the sky. You cover a fair bit of sky, but only reached out to 100 miles or so. So it was much better if you could have an airborne early warning aircraft with us, which in the old days used to be a Shackleton. And to be fair, I, I used to love seeing the Shackleton, but it was slow and unwieldy. The radar was cir circa 1944 and wasn't uh, brilliant. Uh, and despite the fact that they were wonderful people who flew them, uh, operationally, they uh, we really needed something more modern. And we were always pleased when an AWACS, uh, certainly later on in my career, uh, came up. Uh, but those guys were magic, uh, guys and girls. Uh, although I did actually once uh, work with a super constellation. I think the USAF, before the days of their AWACS, used to use super connets for their airborne early warning, and that was uh, a sight to see, I tell you. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, how, how long did it take you then to reach the intercept normally? Um, you've got to, depending entirely where it was, really, it was probably two or 300 miles away. Uh, you're doing uh, nine miles a minute, so uh, you know and, uh, you, we could both do the math. Two nines ready, three nines twenty-seven, um, forty-five minutes, perhaps half an hour. Uh, and uh, if we were the Q1 first launched off, and particularly if it was a no-notice scramble, uh, we would go without any support; it would just be us. Um, quite often, they would then launch a tanker, and the tankers came from Marham, from down south, so they'd have to get up the coast to where we were. And as they came abeam Lucas, they'd launch Q2 to go and meet the tanker. And if we'd made the intercept, uh, as we ran short of fuel, uh, the tanker and Q2 would arrive, and they would take over, and we'd go back to Lucas and uh, go back on readiness there, waiting to see if anything else occurred. And then Q2 would continue to monitor uh, the Soviet aircraft, and every time he needed fuel, he'd just drop back to the tanker, who was probably five miles in trail, take some gas, top himself back up, and then uh, he'd go back and continue with uh, the shadowing of the aircraft. Right. And um, that way we had some pretty long missions. You know, uh, if you were there with the tanker, you could you know, work for five or six hours without any problem at all. Um, and uh, quite often the missions, if it was a, a complex one, uh, they might even have uh, generated another aircraft uh, to come up who would uh, come up with a second tanker and would continue to monitor the situation with a Q3 aircraft. Um, so we always had aircraft in readiness and the squadron could generate more aircraft if they were required. In fact, you know, had days when it was very busy. We, we got, you know, Q4, Q5, began to wonder if the war had started. Um, <laughs> the number of airplanes around, it, particularly if there was a big NATO exercise on, or a, particularly a fleet exercise, the Soviets were always very interested, and they'd launch a lot of aircraft to go and monitor uh, and find out what they could about that. So right. it was very busy for us. Yeah. So was it generally single aircraft you had coming over, or if there was an exercise, there would be multiple aircraft? Rarely singles, uh, usually pairs or perhaps a four. Um, most of the time, uh, TU-95 bears of various marks, uh, some uh, photo reconnaissance, some maritime reconnaissance, some um, nuclear-capable bombers. And just, um, to, just to describe, for the, the, the bear is this large four-engine uh, turboprop. Absolutely, yeah. It's still I, flying yeah. now with the Russian Air Force. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and um, I, I think it still remains the fastest turboprop ever built. Uh, Sweat wing. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the engines, but they were very powerful. And 
and uh, drove two enormous counter-rotating propellers, uh, two propellers for each engine. The, the props were over 12 feet in diameter, and uh, they went so fast, the tips used to go supersonic, and they used to make a hell of a din and a lot of vibration, which uh, it, we could feel and hear in the, in the cockpit when you were uh, formating on them. Uh, quite dramatic aeroplanes. So, yeah, they, they've been their mainstay for uh, maritime uh, reconnaissance and maritime attack for, for many a year. Mm. And uh, there are, and no reason why they're not going to continue to use them for years in the same way that the United States Air Force still fly the B-52 around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so how, how would you approach the intercept? Would you come at them head on or from the side or from behind, or it just depended on what direction they're going in? That's exactly right. So the aspect of the intercept was really set up by just the geometry of how it was all going to happen. Um, we'd obviously uh, try and get there as quickly as possible. So uh, if it's head on, great. You can have great closure. Uh, if you're on a sort of 90 uh, it's a pretty slack old intercept. Uh, you can't use the geometry to close, so you might use a bit of extra speed. But uh, whatever, the idea was to get within visual range and then turn the radar off. The last thing we wanted to do was uh, give uh, more information about our uh, radar frequencies and about the um, sort of things that you can pick up uh, when you listen to uh, a radar that's painting you, and we never locked the radar. And presumably, that was the whole idea they were coming over was to test our defences and see how we would react. That is, they, they used to nibble at our defences to see whether, where, and when we could intercept them, how quickly we could get to them, and um, sometimes we would deliberately not intercept them. Sometimes we would pre-position aircraft and catch them un unawares. So we, we didn't just keep intercepting them all the time at uh, the first opportunity because that obviously gives them a definite red line. But we would uh, show our willingness to intercept uh, these aircraft all the time, um, I inevitably, because, um, you know, you, you just if you don't intercept them, then they will start to assume that they can come closer and closer and closer to the UK um, uh, without any concerns. The idea was to show them that we could see them and we would keep an eye on them. And, uh, you know, we were going to monitor their activity. And, and apart from this, they're not just trying out and playing with our air defense. They're actually there on a, often on an operational mission. So they might be hunting our nuclear submarines in which case they would be on an operational mission to go and drop sonar boys and try and find out the whereabouts of uh, our shipping, uh, our Navy, um, and our submarines, uh, in which case we would be monitoring them throughout, and we would often uh, you know, watch these guys and we'd be trogging along at medium level, and then they'd suddenly start descending and uh, then entering sonar boy dropping patterns, and we'd be uh, watching what they do all the time uh, to try and get what intelligence we could from them. As at the same time as photographing their airframes, uh, noticing any new equipment they had on, just uh, trying to find out how it was, uh, how their aircraft were being developed. Uh, we always very keen to get the door numbers off the uh, nose wheel uh, uh, doors. They painted a number there. That was one of the few indications of which airframe. Uh, but we discovered that it was also very important to get detailed pictures of all over the airframe because um, knowing that we would record their door numbers, they often switched door numbers around, made up uh, new numbers to make their fleets seem bigger perhaps than they were. And it was up to our intelligence boffins to use the art of dentology to uh, find scratches and marks on the airframe that would indicate that even if the door number had been changed, this was the old uh, number 63 that, that we saw last year and back out again. Because there's one thing you can easily do, and that's hide a dink or a scratch that's on the outside of the airplane. Well, if you enjoyed Nick's stories, I'm delighted to say there is more. A second episode will be coming soon where we hear about Soviet countermeasures against the intercepts, including efforts to down RAF aircraft. 
We also talk about the end of the Cold War and the strange experience of entertaining Soviet pilots at an RAF base months after treating each other as mortal foes. I really recommend the show notes as we have some great photos that Nick shared with us, as well as some fascinating video. The show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 43. If you like what you're listening to, do join our Facebook discussion group where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with our guests and other interested parties. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. We're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod. Lastly, if you like what you're hearing, do leave reviews on iTunes. It really helps us to spread the word. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the podcast. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.